Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero Show where we code a complete game live on stream. Now one of the things that I get asked um, a lot because we don't really cover it on Handmade Hero. Uh, one of the things I get asked a lot is what do you do about source code control? Right? This is a very common question. What do you do about source code control? Um, do you use Git? Why don't you use Git to, to store the game? Um, you know, what's, what's the plan there, right? And I haven't addressed it, and it's been, you know, we've been doing this series for a long time. It's great. I love seeing everyone on the stream every week. Um, and I just felt like at some point I was going to have to, uh, I was going to have to talk to you about how source code control should work, what you should do, that sort of thing. So the answer, you know, everyone always says switch to Git whenever anyone's having trouble with source code control. It's absolutely true. Git's obviously the most powerful uh, industry standard source code control out there. You've got to know how to use it. Uh, and personally, I just think people would be crazy to use anything else. Now, I understand the reticence that people have when using Git, okay? Because it is, it was a, you know, it was a hardcore professional grade thing. You know, Linus Torvald or Linus Torvald, I'm sorry, I don't know the pronunciations uh, as well as I should. Um, when he was writing it, you know, he wanted something for serious kernel development. So, you know, this, this isn't something that's supposed to be super friendly or, you know, like all fancy gooey or anything like that. You know, it's a serious command line utility. So I understand it can be daunting. And so what I thought I'd do at the beginning of today's stream is I just wanted to give people a little introduction to like, if you were on your own project, right, and you wanted to use source code control for it, and you know, maybe you're, you're a beginner, uh, or maybe you're e even intermediate, but you don't, like taking the step to get something as hardcore as Git is a little bit scary for you. I just want to demystify you and show that it's really not, um, it, it, you know, it shouldn't be something that's, that's scary. So I, pre I prepared a little thing here. I made a temp git directory and, you know, I, I, I guess folks probably know, you know, I, I did this hash function called meow hash and I put it up on GitHub. Now, one of the things about GitHub that you, you might not know if you've only ever browsed on the web is, is actually you can use Git to interact directly with it. So if you go <clears throat> to any GitHub page, there's actually this clone or download button here, right? And in that window, uh, there's, there's a URL and you can use that, that URL with the Git command line utility. So what I'm gonna do so I'm going to show you how to get that, uh, this repository, my meow hash repository. I'm going to show you how to use Git to just quickly and easily just get it onto your machine. And if we encounter any problems along the way, I'll show you, I'll explain what they mean, and I'll show you how to get around them. Uh, okay, so let's start with just the simple, uh, the basic thing that you're going to want to do uh, for any Git thing. Uh, well, you know what, let me, let me start a little bit uh, simpler. So if you just type Git, uh, what you'll get is this this kind of yeah I, I don't want to be pedantic about it, but I say it's it's kind of useless this this is like a little help screen and it only has the really basic commands uh, on it right so these are like sort of the things that you would most commonly call but anyone who really uses Git seriously knows that there's if that's not most of the things you're going to do are going to be more advanced than these commands so these are really just uh, I would ignore this screen. What you want to do is focus on this down here. If you do git help minus a, what that'll do is that'll list all the commands in git. So not just the common ones. So if I do a git uh, help minus a, what you can see is that'll, that'll list all the commands that, that git um, has, has in it in toto, right? Now, obviously this listing can go on for a while because there's a lot of commands in git. I mean, one of the things you have to understand about git is it's, it's industry standard now. So everyone kind of has, um, uh, I, I don't know how to say it, but it's, it's a lot like the Linux kernel, right? It started off as something small. It's based, both, both were made by Linux Torvalds, right? Started off small, then they become a lot more, um, a lot more widespread, a lot more widely used. And so even though originally Git probably had only 100, 200, 300 commands, uh, I think at last count, there's something like 395,000 commands in Git, give or take. It depends, like you, know, you can install modules to it. So uh, this is just the baseline version which has, I think, the 395 uh, of K. Some installations can have 1.2, 1.3 million, but those commands, 
you don't necessarily need those for everyday use. This this set of 395,000 is are the ones that you you would generally be using day to day, right? So uh, I, I don't necessarily recommend doing the 1.2, 1.3 million root. That's just that's just too many commands. And usually with a combination of some, you know, 12, 13, 14 of those 395,000 base set commands, you can usually do what you want. And so a lot of times if you look at the 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 million uh, commands there, those a lot of them are really just repackaging or like convenience versions of ones that you already have in the base you know set that's the relatively concise uh you know 400k uh set set of commands this this listing can take a while this is mostly windows it doesn't have a very efficient uh command line as you know linux is obviously the place for command line so this this could go on for a while so i'm just going to control c out of this you don't really need to know uh all of these just yet you will want to go through every single one of these commands eventually and you really familiarize yourself with what each of them uh, can do because otherwise you're really not using Git to its fullest potential. So you do want to look at that list. Obviously, you can pipe it to more or, or something if you want to page through it one at a time. It only takes a, a couple weeks to get through that whole list. Uh, obviously, I've done it before. It's really and it's pretty eye opening because there's a lot of stuff in there that you wouldn't uh, necessarily know about. So anyway, like I was saying, what we want to do is we want to start with a really basic Git command. It's called Git clone. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're just going to take this this uh, URL here that's provided uh, for, for, you know, it's part of the, the GitHub repository. I'm just going to paste it in and that's it, right? So again, people say that Git's scary. I don't know why they say that. It's not, you know, that, that line right there will get you all the code. So you just hit return and it'll do it, right? Uh, and then one of the things, this happens a lot to people is they'll start using the repository right away after they do the clone. Uh, and I really don't recommend that. That's a source of a lot of problems for people uh, because typically what happens is if you, if you clone a repository, all that's doing is moving the files onto your machine, right? But you still haven't done anything yet to make sure that those files are actually ready to be used, right? It's just, it's just a copy. It's not like a preparation. Um, and so what, what you really want to do to make sure that everything is ready to go and you can actually start editing them is you want to use a command called git bless. And what git bless does is it takes the repository that you're in and it goes through every file and makes sure that in a spiritual sense you're ready to edit that file without git getting confused about what the file is supposed to do, right? So it's kind of like, it's, it's like a, just like, an, the reason it's called bless is it's kind of like likening it to a religious ceremony. A lot of you out there are probably atheists or whatever. I don't, so I don't want to imply there's like any real religion behind it. Anyone can use this command. Uh, regard, it's non-denominational, but it's, it's just evoking that sort of preparation, right? You know, like don't, you're, you don't want to do uh, the animal sacrifice before you have the holy water or whatever, right? You know, I, mean, I don't know. I'm not familiar with how these things go. The same is true with Git. You want to make sure that the code is blessed before you modify it. Otherwise, when you go to do subsequent Git commands, who knows what could happen, right? I mean, you, you've more or less angered the gods at that point. So what you want to do is do a Git bless. And you can just hit Git bless return here. But I'm actually using a couple switches to Git bless because in order to do Git bless properly, I, I want to do a couple things. So I'm going to actually do a, a, a CPP uh, reverse um, uh, gardening on this one. And what that'll do is if you do CPP reverse gardening, so I should say first before we get too far down that rat hole, I'm not going to cover like exactly what gardening is. Uh, but gardening involves essentially leaving space between the files. Uh, if you normally what will happen, there's a default level of gardening. So when the files get placed in directories, there's a certain amount of empty space in between them. And that's, that's if you want your code to go to seed right after so that it will produce smaller versions of itself subsequently. If you want Git to do that as it, you know, as it builds hashes and, and stores backup versions of files, you want that empty space in there. I'm call me old fashioned. I don't like to use a lot of space on the drive. So I use reverse gardening. Uh, and basically what you do is if you say the language that you're using, so CPP, and then you do reverse gardening, it'll say for all CPP files, take the amount, take the space that you would have been using and actually reclaim that for other purposes. So I like to use, do a git bus to CPP reverse gardening to reduce the gardening. Um, and then I also like to do a uh, fallow rose heavy, right? 
which lets it know that on every other row that normally you would be saving for the next time, right, that you do uh, a git bless, that these are going to be planted at the normal density that they would have been, right? So when you do that git uh, 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 planting, and then finally, what I like to do is I like to do this. Uh, you can do this two ways. You can do it the normal way. You can do it retrograde. So if you do it retrograde, it'll start at the furthest row for gardening and it will go backwards. Whereas if you were going to do it the normal way, you wouldn't have any of that reverse motion, right? So I'm going to just do the git bless in this repository. As you can see, it's just going to go through. It's going to do some credentials checks. Uh, it's got to make room for the changes and that sort of thing and, and branches and caches and stuff. Okay, so again, one of the things that happens in Git, it, it's definitely something that people, uh, again, it puts people off. I don't think they should be scared about these sort of things. The error messages are a little bit cryptic, right? Errors in Git happen all the time, especially when you're working with a public repository, because remember, you're taking, you're taking a repository that was made on someone else's machine uh, or even on your own machine. You know, if you if you have a multi-machine environment, maybe even you made it, but you made it on a different machine. You're moving it to a new machine, and so just the environments are a little bit different. So even if you're doing fairly standard stuff like Git clone or Git bless, sometimes you can get uh, basically you can get these these errors that crop up. They're just they're not a big deal. So I really encourage you to not get scared. Just read the error message, and usually what it says is the problem, right? So you can see here it says that unrevert mail would overwrite previous dget tree, right? And all that means is we did two git operations, right? So that first clone, in that first clone operation, there's a ton of stuff that has to happen. So one step of the clone operation is called get tree, right? And that's the thing that actually brings the remote repository onto your system, okay? That dget tree operation is just the reverse of that because after you've gotten the tree, you need to like effectively do, undo that operation. You have to dget right that tree. Otherwise, you still have the tree in addition to the files, which you don't want, right? And so in this case, what it's basically saying is that I didn't set up any mailing system. Normally, whenever you do a git bless, it'll send mail to everyone in the blessings list so that each one of those people knows that the source code has been blessed, right? It's a little bit like a papal edict or something so that everyone knows within that sort of blessing circle who, you, you, everyone's been notified. So nobody thinks they have to bless it twice. Like, no, you don't wanna waste time re-blessing code that's already been blessed. So what it's trying to do here, right, is it's trying to unrevert the mail changes that it thinks have happened because normally when you do a git bless you've been through a couple different mail cycles uh, and what it's realizing is that it's doing that right after a dget tree operation and if you try to unrevert the mail list the mail like blessing list or any other mail list there's there's something like 75 different mail list types in git uh, and this one in particular is talking about the blessing uh, mailing list because that's the one that we're doing obviously but you know it, there's there's different ones for different commands so if the unrevert mail operation would overwrite that the the situation that would have happened with the dget tree where it moved it out of the way right that creates an error scenario it's again it's easy as pie to solve these these are not hard all you have to do is call the unrevert mail with a force command so if you just say look i do want to unrevert mail all right because that's what it thinks to do just do minus minus ignore dget tree warnings right that will stop that and you can see also in the, there's a, a secondary note that says that the latest pro ignore quilt uh, and it gives you that mail address right the one that's that was the mail it was on when it realized that it couldn't unrevert the mail because of the blessing dget tree that occurred right so what's going to happen here is you need to first ignore those dget tree warnings and then what you want to do is look at the secondary list and for so in that case quilting is a thing that happens in git uh, that I don't really, it's sort of like gardening, I, I don't want to go down the whole rat hole, but basically what it is, is it's for, it's for taking disparate pieces of the source tree and basically, you know, stitching them together, right? It's kind of a git term of art. Um, and so there's, there's a, multiple different ways. There's a pre-ignore, there's a post-ignore, there's a pro-ignore, which is basically like, I have mindset to doing all of the like advanced feature levels. So if you, if you have your git configured to be doing the most advanced version of all the commands, you're going to get pro-ignore messages. Um, you can get amateur ignore messages if you have yours on the normal level. Also porcelain ignore messages. So pro-ignore quilt is just saying that 
the, the, the thing that was telling it that it didn't need to worry about quilt operations, right, um, on that particular mail was the thing that triggered the mail conflict, the unrevert mail conflict with the dget tree. So even though git unrevert mail minus minus ignore dget tree warnings probably would work here, I also want to give it a few quilt directives just so it knows that that's not a stopping factor, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and do a, a minus minus um, quilt always, which is basically saying, look, don't ignore the quilting, um, pro or otherwise. Just do the quilting you would normally do, regardless of what else happened, right? And then I'm also going to do a minus minus um, uh, skip mail, and then I'm just going to type in this exact. You really want to make sure this is exact. If you have, this is one of those things that people can really get in trouble. If you do a skip mail and then you put anything other than like a real mail hash in there, that can easily delete lots of existing work that you've done. So you want to make sure that you really like, like don't take a second when you do a skip mail directive and just make sure that you're typing that 100% accurate. Okay. So now we're going to do that unrevert mail uh, and, and we'll just, I think this will be fine now. Uh, it just, sometimes it'll take, okay. So one of the other problems that you will see uh, is that Git always is going to build a thing. There's, there's essentially graphs underlying each Git operation. If you think about what's happening conceptually in a Git operation, what it is, is it builds sort of a set of nodes that are the possible states that the source tree could be in. And then what it's going to do is it's going to build a graph of the path through those states it wants to take ideally to solve the to do, not solve to do the command that you're telling it to do like in this case the unrevert mail right um so in this case it built one of those graph subsets that it wanted to use right and when it traversed through it when it was done it was not able to remove that graph from the tree. That's the unset up graph pass is the thing that removes finished graph sections from the complete graph before the command is over. Because again, Git really doesn't want you to lose work. I mean, it wants the work you lose to be your fault, I guess is the way to say it. Obviously it loses work all the time. Um, it wants that work uh, to, to be verifiable. So if it can't unset up all the graphs in the graph set, then it's not going to do it. This usually happens because the graph state got partially held over from a previous command. Uh, there's a thing called graph forwarding that happens automatically. Um, it is basically there to save you time, but sometimes it actually creates errors, like in this case. So what you want to do here is pretty simple. It's just there's a git reset operation. And what that does, it says clear everything, right? Just clear all the states. Uh, don't hold over the graphs. But one of the things is, if you are in pro mode, so you probably haven't set your thing up for this, so you won't have to use these switches, but if you're in pro mode, graph reset by default, uh, I'm sorry, git reset by default, won't do a full graph reset. It'll do what's called a hermeneutic graph reset, which is basically the same as a normal graph reset, but it won't get unrevert mail items, right? Because it assumes that the mail cluster and who you're sending mail to is not what you're trying to reset. You're just trying to set the file state. So what I need to do here is do no hermeneutic, right? So that way, when it does the reset, it's not going to do a hermeneutic graph reset. It's going to do a real full graph reset. And then the other thing you should always do here is force, right? Because otherwise, if you did the no hermeneutics, it might warn you that like there would have been a hermeneutic, right? I'm saying like, no, force, right? Okay, so it's doing it. All right, so I think we're basically done. I know this is making Git probably look harder than it really is, uh, but these are just this is just what happens, right? You saw there's no weirdness going on here, right? It's just when you're trying to sync a source tree for the first time, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. All right, so in here you can see uh, we're having a particular problem with the try hash. Now, there's three or four levels of, of uh, hashing in Git. Uh, you don't probably need to concern yourself too much with each individual one. There's the primary hashes, there's by hashes, and there's try hashes. Now the primary hashes are hashes that actually come from your files. By hashes are when Git needs to look at two different files and combine their hashes into one hash. And then a try hash is when that by hash gets combined with two other by hashes. Now this is a common mistake. 
People often think a trihash is a combination of three regular hashes. It's not. A trihash is a combination of three bi hashes. So it's really like a six way hash, but trihash was just the term that sort of stuck. So we still call them trihashes, and there is no real Git term for uh, three hashes that were normal hashes combined together. A lot of people will call it a uh, 3x hash, uh, but you know, it's again, it's not baked into the program, so it's kind of just, that's vernacular at that point, right? Now again, this was happening because we tried to do uh, resetting of that mail graph. Basically what it's saying is, when it was trying to record all of the hashes of those file graphs that it was producing, in order to undo the hermeneutic graph holdover from the revert mail. Now, obviously I use IMAP for mail. That's where you're getting this in here, right? Um, one of the things that you run into is Git divides the mail servers that it can talk to into a few different types, right? There's direct mail servers, there's indirect mail servers, there's semantic mail servers, and there's symbolic mail servers, right? And so symbolic mail servers are mail servers that don't actually exist. Like they're mail servers that are effectively um, imaginary, right? And so what you're doing when you use a symbolic mail server is you're saying, let's pretend there's a mail server so that we can complete this operation. But when we're done, we're not actually going to send any mail, right? And so what's happening with the trihash scribe index is it's, it's trying to record what the trihash was of that six way set of files, right? It's trying to put that into the global trihash index so that it can do what's called a quad push, which is taking four trihashes at a time. This is a performance thing. Four trihashes at a time to the symbolic server, right? It, it's basically like if you were to do each individual trihash, you'd be wait, there'd be a lot of dead space in the symbolic server packets. So a quad push takes four of those at a time and does them all the, you know, all at once, right? And so what you get out of a quad push is a lot more performance, but it's a lot riskier, right? In pro mode, I want to do quad pushes. I want to be faster all the time. I know how to handle these errors. This is not what I'm going to go into too much detail because, uh, so I'm not going to explain how we're going to fix it. We're just going to fix it because I don't think you're going to see this one. Because if you don't have uh, pro level settings engaged, you're never going to get a quad push error because it's just going to be doing single push the symbolic server uh, to do those mail operations when, when mail is effectively uh, sort of being emulated during that, that operation. So I'm just going to type in the line that fixes this and you don't have to worry too much about this. All right, so once you've got essentially all of that taken care of, okay. Um, so I actually wasn't expecting this. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm really sorry about this. So Git divides things into two sections. It's called porcelain and plumbing. So porcelain, it's, it's basically think of a toilet, right? This is the analogy they use. Uh, in a toilet, you've got the plumbing, which is the thing that actually does the work. And you got a porcelain, which is the thing that you actually see as a human and interface with, right? So normally, because I'm in pro mode, I turn all the porcelain stuff off. But because I was trying to do a demo today, I enabled the porcelain stuff, which is basically the user interface, like foofy stuff. It's stuff that you should turn off as soon as you can. You know, once you're familiar with the 395,000 base commands, you can turn off the porcelain nonsense. It's not useful. Uh, but I had turned it on, and so you can see once we were working with that scribe index, when it tried to do the try revert based on a command that I gave it, um, probably because I said exacerbate shim, but again, I don't really want to go into what that does, um, that caused a conflict with what it would normally do. The reverse of a quad push is a quad read, right? You can see it happening down in here. So the quad read that was trying to get back from the symbolic server what the pretty message was to display on this command that failed and it failed because obviously I, the, I didn't go into how you set up a Git symbolic server. Uh, obviously I did that beforehand. That's kind of a more advanced topic. Uh, I would just let one of the default installers do it for you. But when I set mine up, right, 
I set it up a pro level. I didn't put, I didn't install the porcelain modules. It doesn't even have those messages. So you're gonna get those problems uh, cropping up. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the exact same command again. I'm gonna say no porcelain, um, and I'm gonna say uh, unprint errors. That way it won't think it needs to get those messages, right? Let's give that one more shot. This, I think this, this should be fine. I think we're good here. Uh, all right. So one of the problems that you will see when you're trying to fix a quilting problem like that, because you noticed before that beforehand, right? I don't know if you remember when we were executing this command up here. Let's just go back up here. I told it to do quilt always. So what you're really supposed to do in that particular command, right? If you're doing an actual unrevert mail here, the safe way to do an unrevert mail is to actually open up a text editor and to list. You, what you want to do is you want to list all of the things that should actually be quilted, which is typically not all of them. And so one of the problems is if you have something that's formatted in a way such that it can't be quilted, then a later command will eventually try to verify that quilt. Again, using the performance mode here, it's trying to do them four at a time. That's not the problem here. Even the single verify quilt would have failed when it tries to verify a quilt on something that was not formatted for quilting, which of course I accidentally induced it to do by just saying quilt always, that's gonna fail, right? Again, we can run the same command. We just have to add one more switch, which is that like, if you ignore quilt errors, right? And requilt uh, unquilted formats, that should take care of any, like quilting is not an essential feature, so basically, it's just saying, look, if there was a quilting error, don't worry about it. Just requilt any of those uh, quilt sections that were wrong, right? Uh, so crossing our fingers here, this this hopefully will be the the one that actually finally gets the repository into a good uh, state. Perfect, right? So now, if I just do a directory, you can see there's meow hash. I go in there, right? There it is. It's all ready for me, um, and and totally set to go. So I hope that that uh, gave you some uh, appreciation for how simple it is to just get started on Git, Git, right? I mean, we had some errors and some of them were a little bit complicated, you know, I agree, but hopefully you could see from my explanations of them, once you, once you pull back the curtain and, and just see what's actually going on, right? Once you know um, about, you know, quilts and, and hermeneutic graphs and all those sorts of things, it, it becomes actually very simple to navigate your way through it. You don't have to be scared, right? Sometimes it deletes all of your changes or all of your data, that's okay. That's just an excuse to start over. A lot of times, you know, writing code fresh is better, right? Um, and so I think a lot of the criticism leveled at Git that is too complicated, that it, it loses all your files, uh, those sorts of things. I, I don't really think that that's uh, true, right? That's, that's just, that's people blowing things out of proportion uh, not learning how to use the software. You know, these are people who probably only know how to use six, seven, eight thousand out of the 395,000 commands in Git, not to mention the switches, uh, which they probably just don't even know about, right, a lot of the times. Um, so I really do think it's worth your time to just, you know, forget that stuff and say, I'm going to commit some time to learning Git. It's not that hard. Uh, and, and I think everyone out there who follows Handmade Hero, it, you can do it. Um, and the, the rewards that you will reap from learning this are immense, right? Like I said, you know, you can go from a situation where uh, you, you know, were doing work every day with files and had to, you know, use something like, I don't know, like SVN or something like that, um, that, you know, doesn't lose your files and can store binary data and is relatively easy to use. Uh, you can go to something like Git that's way more powerful and only sometimes loses your files um, and you know, only it, it probably takes only two or three hours a day uh, of work um, in Git to copy things from like one machine to another and stuff like that, which is well worth the time investment. So I highly recommend it. I think everyone should, in fact, switch to Git. Um, and hopefully, this tutorial is, is enough to like whet your appetite. Uh, there's a lot of great tutorials out there, so you know, seek them out. Um, and before we get started on actually programming today, let me just go and, and ask. Does the stream have any questions? Did, did, did all of that make sense? I hope I was kind of talking a lot there. Did anyone have any questions um, for me about what we covered just there uh, on Git? Uh, any, anything that you, you want me to, to, to show you um, in addition to that? Uh, so Reductum said, could you go over the git soil archive command? I've had a really hard time understanding the docs on it. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could I could definitely do that. Um let me let me just let me just uh fire that up here. Okay. Um don't worry about that error message, it's not important. Uh okay. Could you go over the git soil archive command? I totally can. I just, I staged this repository for it. So the git soil archive command, that's this command. Um, what the git soil archive command does is it's basically saying, um, much like when you see that, uh, remember I was talking about that um, gardening, the reverse gardening. So normally when you do an archive, what's gonna happen is it's gonna get rid of the those those uh, that spacing right that gardening uh, if you had gardening in the art in the uh, repository normally when you do the archive it's gonna get rid of that right and so the problem with that when you do an archive is when the person decompresses the archive on the other end they lose all the gardening so git soil archive is something you do to an archive ahead of time in order to make sure that when you put a Git repository into the archive, it still has that padding, right? So in our case, what we would do is we'd say like Git soil archive, like, you know, like now hash.tgz or some, any other archive type that you want. They're all bit in, I think Git has their support for 73 different archive formats. So, uh, you know, you can use pretty much everything that you want. So you do Git soil archive, the archive to use, uh, and then you want to do like um, probably uh, gardening optimal, because you want it to look at how much should be put in, so how much, you have a certain amount of soil, right? You can't just make it out of thin air. So you gotta figure out how much soil do you wanna leave in the, in the ground, right, in the repository, and how much soil you wanna put into the actual archive itself for the re receiving repository, or garden, as it were, right? Gardening Optimal uh, will compute that, but one of the problems with, so, all right, uh, I don't wanna, spend too much time on Git today, so I'm sorry if this is a little bit truncated of an explanation, but optimal gardening is a problem that computer science hasn't been able to solve. It's, it's NP complete, no one really knows uh, to what extent you can do literally optimal gardening. So when you supply an optimal, when you pass an optimal gardening switch to Git, you need to tell it in addition to the optimal gardening something called a p parameter and the p parameter is a thing that the optimal gardening heuristic inside git will use to know when it has gotten the gardening optimal enough right um because actually ensuring fully optimal gardening is not always possible so you want to supply an optimal uh, a optimal gardening parameter. I usually use uh, 0.07894513312, uh, which is also what, what Linus uh, Torvalds recommends. He, you know, he's I think he's right on this. There's competing uh, camps on whether you should use um, uh, this constant or uh, there's other constants out there that are sort of made about. I would stick with this one. So if you pass an optimal gardening parameter to Git Soil Archive, um, and then you probably also want to do, uh, so normally when you do a Git Soil Archive, what it will do is it'll soil the archive and then it will re-soil itself, right? Um, in other words, the, the, the local repository. So uh, what you want to do is um, do not re-soil yourself uh, at the, and you can also do, alternately you can do like do not soil yourself, um, but do not soil yourself will take effect for all future Git invocations. It'll actually update the config. So what you want to do is do not re-soil yourself so that it knows that only during this particular command, right, that it should do that. So hopefully that uh, makes some uh, some sense. Does anyone have, uh, I don't know, like, while that's running, um, let's see here. What if atomization fails? So atomization failures are not a huge deal. Um, you can just run git uh, pre-atomize with minus minus ignore atomization failures, and that should take care of most of that. If it doesn't, then uh, I don't know. Oh, the t mm. okay. So the xref server on this machine is kind of borked, so I would... Uh, don't worry, ignore that, that won't happen. This, this command is fine for you to use. Uh, 
that has to do with the Express server setup in this machine, which never worked right, so it's, it's, it doesn't matter. Let me see here if we got anyone. Uh, let's see here. Um, um, I've heard the sequel says, I heard uh, new th recently proved gardening had a probabilistic polynomial time algorithm. It just has huge coefficients. So if that's true, that could be pretty huge for Git. Um, I don't know to what extent I believe that. I mean, I want, I, if Knuth says it's probably right, I mean, he's obviously a godfather of computing. So, you know, I don't want to uh, challenge his authority on that. But I, like I said, I don't know anything about that. I haven't, I haven't seen that news. Um, Lumblean says, I'm still skeptical with this affect the arrangement of my garden gnomes. Rearranging them is not really something that I'm able to do as they are permanently fixed in place. Um, okay, so... I, I guess what I'd say about that is statuary is a very advanced feature in Git gardening. And I don't want to mislead you by suggesting that you can just start rearranging um, the Git gardening gnomes to anywhere inside the repository and not have huge potential pitfalls awaiting you. You can. I just want to make it clear that there is no such thing as a fixed git garden gnome. All gnomes are movable. You just have to use the assume mutable gnomes flag on whatever command you would have used. So for example, if you were going to use um, a git bless by gnome command, right? Which is to say you wanted to use those garden gnomes as the thing that was actually going to do the repository blessing. If that would have given you an error that's like error gnomes are fixed in this case, right? What you can do is just say assume mutable gnomes. A lot of people don't know about that switch, but it totally works. If you do that, it will never give you a fixed gnome error. Now this probably won't work because I didn't actually set up any uh, gnomes in this particular garden repository, but that's, I, I just want to make it clear that's, uh, that, so again, Pretty much all the problems we're getting are with the IMAPS uh, server, the, the mail servers, right? Um, so I, I really don't want you to, to you know, ProCP insta column is basically when you are trying to copy column from one to the other in pro mode uh, and you want to do it without the normal verify step. Uh, you, you can see that it's having a problem with the, with the fact that I have more than one IMAP server listed. That's probably just something happened when I did the config to put in the amateur porcelain stuff. Uh, the same thing that screwed up the XREF server probably screwed this up, right? It's again, fixable. You don't even need to worry about that error. Can you explain the tricycle entropy option? Um, so, I mean, I guess what I'd say about tricycle entropy is unless you're working on like literally government grade encryption standards, tricycle entropy is really not necessary. So bicycle entropy is way, way faster. It's about 17 times faster because tricycle entropy is, is gonna do tons of iterations. So I would just say use minus minus bicycle entropy because that's gonna give you a way more uh, efficient op entropy operation, whichever one you were doing with really no downgrade in security unless you're expecting like state level attackers basically right plus if you're going to do tricycle entropy you would also have to do um an i uh, minus minus massad uh on it as well just to make sure that it it uses uh massad approved enclosures because other only massad strength enclosures are resistant to the kind of attacks that tricycle entropy is designed to uh prevent so again, you're in state actor territory there, and you're you're going to be wanting to use, um, if not Mossad level enclosures, use Five Eyes enclosures um, or something that's that's you know state level encryption quality because you're basically saying I want state level encryption because I expect state level actor uh, threat profiles, right? Um, all right. I don't want to spend too much more time on Git. I uh, hopefully that gave everyone a good understanding of. Uh, how it all works and and uh, how to get started with it. Um, let's go ahead and, and, and go on with the series.